Welcome to uh, everyone here in Washington, D.C. in person and to those online. Uh, the session today is Africa's Future, Democracy, Governance, and Human Rights and Partners, as were the previous two and future monthly uh, forums are the African Center for the Study of the United States, the University of the Zoyland in Johannesburg, the Center for African Studies at Howard University, Institute for African Studies here at George Washington University, uh, and the USC uh, University of Southern California Annenberg Center for Communication, Leadership, and Policy, of which uh, uh, I'm a member. The next forum uh, for your calendars will be Monday, March 27th. The topic will be trade and investment. Uh, for those here in person in Washington, we have speaker biographies on that side of the room. Uh, we have uh, water in the back of the room. Coffee is on the way. And for those online, we're going to have speaker bios and uh, other uh, other featured information available uh, on our website by uh, by this time next month. So uh, uh, that will be something to become an information resource, not just for these um, uh, these forums, but we hope for uh, the partnership and for uh, those on both sides of the ocean. We'll go shortly to our speakers in Africa, uh, but first. Oh, uh, we have uh, someone uh, here, uh, Jennifer, who just came back from Nigeria uh, from observing the election there, and one of the largest, the largest mm -hmm. democracies in the world. So, Jennifer, a few notes on uh, the election. Sure. I, I thought I'd maybe frame it up um, and, and frame the event up a little bit uh, before maybe talking a bit about Nigeria. Um, First, at the Africa Leaders Summit in December, um, President Biden announced that the next um, summit on democracy would be held in Zambia at the end of March, March 29th and 30th. And one of the things we wanted to do is hear from people in the field and from all of you kind of um, thoughts on how, what should be prioritized within that summit, uh, both on the African side and on the U.S. side. Um, and so these seminars have been, we've had some fantastic speakers, but it's also been a great conversation with those attending. So we do hope this will be interactive as well. I would say democracy is under threat globally um, as populist authoritarians and not so populist authoritarians uh, kind of exert uh, increasing uh, in, in, uh, in, I push back uh, against democracy in Africa. This has this has been true as well. There are a number of um, places where democracy seems to be moving forward. Zambia would be one of those, I would say. Tanzania, where the president, uh, uh, unlike her predecessor, has opened civic space somewhat. Uh, but in recent years, insecurity and militarization uh, has led to a number of coups in Sudan. Chad, Mali a couple of times, uh, Burkina Faso, and Guinea. Um, at the same time, you've had uh, external partners come in, particularly in the case of Mali or Central Africa, um, kind of uh, propping up in a way and defending uh, some of these authoritarian re regimes. I'm thinking of Wagner's entry into CAR, into Mali, um, kind of uh, less on national stability than on, on um, kind of regime defense. Uh, cyber laws and anti-terror laws have been used to clamp down on civic space. Uh, Iswatini, Uganda, uh, Zimbabwe. And I think very important is the social media has been used to stoke division um, and polarize societies. And this is one I think is probably most uh, threatening to, um, to democracy worldwide, uh, because at the core of democracy is a consensus that even if our policies disagree and we disagree on who we want to lead us, the consensus is around the system of democracy that protects certain freedoms of assembly, of speech, um, and, and we will stick with the rules of the game, win or lose. And I think the um, annual will have civic discourse uh, and thoughtful, deliberative discourse around policies. I think we see it in this country, but we see it elsewhere. Um, when that uh, social fabric begins to fray, 
um, people kind of move into their camps, it becomes very difficult um, to have a, a democratic process. Um, and uh, youth and women's participation in politics has also kind of not progressed necessarily as fast as uh, youth and women uh, might expect and uh, like. Um, faith in African debate, faith in democracy in Africa remains fairly steady. Around 70% uh, believe democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. Uh, those are Afrobarometer figures. Um, there's been a slight decrease in recent years, but still strong antipathy towards one party rule and towards military rule. Um, and support for multi-party elections has uh, declined quite a bit. And I think that may be reflecting a kind of a distrust and declining faith in the process of elections and the fact that elections uh, don't always deliver democracy or better governance. I think one of the things in the summit that, and that President Biden has talked about is that we really need to demonstrate that democracy actually works and democracy actually can deliver things for, for people. Um, and so I think that will be uh, really important. I just came back from Nigeria uh, where I was an elections observer in the Northeast in Adamawa State. Um, you know, Niger I think much of Africa and much of the world is, is looking at Nigeria's uh, uh, kind of the outcome of this election. It's not over yet. They're still counting. I'm guessing there will be a number of case, court cases uh, to follow. Um, but it's Africa's most populous country, 22 million. It's uh, uh, transitioned from military rule almost 25 years ago now. Uh, leaders have respected uh, term limits. Elections have been very messy at times, um, but I still think of this as an open society uh, kind of dynamic and messy. I think these last elections um, were kind of unprecedented in a way. They uh, uh, very competitive elections uh, between the uh, APC, the PDP, and then this uh, just a uh, bullet Tanubu, Atiku, um, uh, Bakar, Atiku, and Peter Obi, a young kind of more dynamic, uh, let's say, figure from the southeast, um, which is not being represented in, in Nigerian politics before. So um, we'll see if it goes to a runoff. Um, I think the, the competence of the election, electoral uh, commission uh, was not, I would maybe give it a low B, <laughs> I was grading. Um, I think they, uh, there were huge delays and that led to lots of frustrations and there were incidents of violence uh, uh, you know, scattered around the country. Um, but I think if this goes forward and if the results are accepted, this could be a huge shot in the arm for democracy um, in Africa and I think worldwide as well. If this kind of disintegrates, uh, the, elect the, the results are not accepted. Um, there's been questions around the transparency of INEC through this process. Um, you know, it could be, it could be tr uh, troubling and, and uh, perhaps not so uh, kind of not so good for uh, democracy uh, worldwide. We can talk a little bit more uh, if, if that's of interest later. But I wanted to turn to our guests um, uh, to uh, give their thoughts on um, uh, kind of the state of democracy, what we are looking for in the uh, uh, democracy summit in March, um, and then we'll open up for uh, questions and discussions from the audience. So let's turn first to uh, Honorable Commissioner Urvina Garisha Topsi Suno, um, who is uh, a member of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. I think you all have her bio, uh, have the bio, so I'm not going to go into a long introduction. Uh, but Honorable Commissioner, welcome. Um, we look forward to your remarks um, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, 
I am honored at the invitation and opportunity to speak to you all today, to speak about the important areas where Africa and the United States can collaborate in promoting democratic principles and good governance. I am the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa, a mechanism embedded in the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. The African Commission is a key institution in Africa's efforts to promote and protect human rights and good governance. The African Commission was established in 1987 under the African Charter and it starts with the promotion and protection of human and people's rights in Africa. The Commission has the potential to play a very crucial role in the US-Africa partnership for the promotion of good governance in Africa. As part of the Commission's mandate, the, cons the Commission periodically monitors various African member states on various issues of human rights concern. In country reports submitted to the Commission by member states on the human rights uh, situation, the Commission has the opportunity to make recommendations to the African governments and other stakeholders on how to promote and protect human rights. As we all know, democracy is the foundation of modern societies and good governance is essential to the prosperity and stability of any country. The African continent is at a pivotal moment in its history, with many countries making progress in strengthening their democratic institutions, promoting transparency and fostering good governance. However, there's much work that still needs to be done. Some of the challenges that still exist in democracy are weak institutions that are not able to provide the necessary checks and balances required for effective democratic governance. Corruption is also a barrier which undermines accountability and transparency and weakens the capacity of institutions to deliver public services. There are also low levels of meaningful political participation, especially of marginalized communities. And this is also a factor that undermines democratic process. Limitations of media in many African countries also tend to be problematic for the full functioning of democracy. Despite these challenges, there are several opportunities for strengthening democracy in Africa including youth engagement, civil society engagement, regional integration and economic growth. These present many opportunities for collaboration and I will speak to four possible considerations that I hope we will consider throughout this engagement. First and foremost, the United States and Africa can work together to strengthen democratic institutions. This can be achieved through supporting the electoral process, promoting the rule of law, and building the capacity of institutions responsible for promoting democratic governance. The United States can also provide technical support for developing and implementing legal frameworks that promote democracy, such as freedom of the press, the right to free and fair elections, and the right to peaceful assembly and association. The African Commission has been active in promoting and protecting the right to a fair trial and the independence of the judiciary. Working with various governments, the Commission, the African Commission can help to strengthen this work of strengthening democratic institutions. Secondly, we can work together to promote good governance. This will involve building strong and effective institutions that are transparent and accountable to the public. The United States can assist African governments in developing anti-corruption strategies, improving public financial management, and strengthening institutions that promote public accountability. This work can be facilitated through the African Union, through its organs which are committed to combating corruption in Africa. At the African Commission specifically, we can ensure the continued monitoring and reporting on corruption in African countries. 
The African Union Advisory Board Against Corruption can support this work when monitoring states by providing technical assistance and advice on anti-corruption measures. Thirdly, the US can strengthen its support to civil society organizations in Africa. Civil society sector plays an important role in promoting democracy and good governance. They provide a voice for citizens and help to hold governments accountable. By supporting civil society organizations, the United States can help to strengthen the foundation of democracy in Africa. The African Commission also works closely with many institutions in the continent, especially those with observer status. Through various instruments, including guidelines on the right to freedom of association and peaceful assembly, the Commission has been active in promoting and protecting the rights of civil society organizations. Fourth and last, the US and Africa can collaborate in promoting economic growth and development. Democracy and good governance are essential for economic growth and prosperity. By supporting trade and investment, promoting private sector development and providing technical assistance, the US can help to create jobs and stimulate economic growth in Africa. In conclusion, Promoting and deepening democracy as well as good governance are essential for Africa's future prosperity and stability. The US and Africa can work together in many ways to promote these values. We can strengthen democratic institutions, promote good governance, support civil society organizations, and stimulate economic growth and development. By working together, we can help to create a brighter future for Africa and the rest of the world. By addressing the challenges facing Africa and seizing the opportunities that are available, I'm confident that the continent, the African continent, can continue on a path towards democratic consolidation and good governance. Thank you. Uh Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and I, I will, I think we'll come back around for questions, um, if, if that's okay, and, and comments. Um, first, I'd like, next, I'd like to turn to Nikiwe Kaunda, uh, Policy Manager at, for Africa at the Open Society Foundations. Um, and Nikiwe, do you want to share your thoughts? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. I think I'm just going to start off with uh, your question about what we should expect for from the Summit for Democracy. I think um, two key things stand out. Um, the first is that we, we would want the summit to cover some of the hard questions, questions around countries in crisis, because, you know, like you rightly you know, alluded to, they actually do pose a threat to, to governance. And there's usually a spillover effect. So if there's instability in one country, it will um, inevitably affect the surrounding countries. And so these are countries like your usual suspects, you know, like Zimbabwe, but we also want to talk about the hard questions, you know, your Tunisias, your Swazilands, for instance. So we're expecting that. The second also is we expect that we, we should cover a bit more uh, on the question of elections. Elections should not be performative. You've just come back from Nigeria and you know what you witnessed, the low levels of trust in INEC, the, the, the breakdown in, in the use of, of, of infrastructure and technology, people losing confidence in the process. So we're saying it's not just a question of holding elections, you know, and people having voter cards and accessing voting stations. Elections do not need to be performative. They need to bring about genuine change, a change that results in people um, being able to enjoy their democratic rights, um, being able to benefit from, from the resources, of, of, from the national, national resources, for instance. But most importantly, we expect the summit to cover questions around um, unconstitutional changes of, of, of government. We've been seeing an increasing number of coups um, across the continent. So that is just, you know, our immediate expectations. Um, thank you so much to Commissioner 
Topsy Sono uh, for providing that really um, enlightening background, a very accurate background of what the context is like on the continent. I just want to spend um, a few minutes talking about the past US Africa Leader Summit that took place in December, the commitments that were made, um, the, the, the narrative and the tone of that narrative and what it actually means for civil society organizations working in, in democracy, governance, human rights, um, even humanitarian responses really. Um, so when we look at the commitments really, they're commendable in that we had the first commitment on the US Africa Space Forum. We had a commitment around the creation of a presidential advisory council on African diaspora and how it can engage in the United States, which is a very pivotal point because the diaspora is the sixth um, targeted stakeholder, if you like, by the African Union. And then we also had the US's formal support for the African Union to become a permanent member of the G20. And then the fourth biggest commitment really was the financial commitments, 55 billion, that would be advanced towards Africa to help it meet some of its developmental um, and governance goals and priorities as articulated in African Union Agenda 2063. So those are some of the really huge commitments. But when you analyze them, you know, are these really new or is it more of the same? For instance, the summit was heavily um, geared towards enterprise and trade. Um, nothing really new there. Um, there was very little opportunity for civil society actors to actually engage with policymakers. Um, even getting a slot uh, at, at the forum dedicated for civil, civil society engagement was very, very difficult. Even though some side events, I think, did try to make an effort. I think there was a semaphore um, side event with President Paul Kagame, for instance, that was really open and accessible. Um, but I think overall, I would say that the commitments are not really a departure from the usual relations. They still focused on trade and economy, but what we're seeing is a very clear articulation of a shift from aid towards, uh, towards investment investment and, and development. So that's a very important shift. Um, and, and I think it spells a shift as well in the narrative of how Africa-US relations are going to be going forward. And, 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 and this is probably in a context of the US's realization, increased realizations of Africa's um, global geopolitical significance. And this is not only in terms of, you know, you know, the Russia-China nexus really. But it's also, I think, realizing that Africa is well positioned to help not just the US, but the rest of the world in terms of energy security, agriculture, natural resources, and the like. Um, we've also seen a shift in narrative as evidenced by the high level bilateral visits that we've seen to several countries, uh, several African countries, as well as a very high level delegation that was sent by the US to the just um, recently completed African Union Commission Summit that, that just concluded last week, right? And, um, and then, you know, when you take the thought further, you would think, oh, it was really great that, you know, the US Africa Leader Summit was held eight years after the initial one, um, but it's, it's more or less of the same rhetoric, right? It's a U.S. strategy for Africa. Africa does not have a strategy for the, for the U.S. So even though that is, is somehow unbalanced, I think it still poses as, as a great opportunity, actually, for Africa and the African Union itself to, to utilize the space um, to develop an international relations policy on how the continent is going to actually engage with with, with, with the US. Um, and just to latch onto that idea, I think that two opportunities are very promising. We've spoken about the Summit for Democracy that's taking place in Zambia in March, 
that's a really good opportunity for African states to come together and say, look, this is our position on key issues and this is how we're going to engage with the United States. But also the US-Africa Trade Summit that is planned for Botswana in June. So these are really huge platforms um, that provide opportunities for Africa itself as well to present its own blueprint on how it's going to take this, re this relationship with the US um, forward. And then just to conclude, I want to talk about what this context may mean for civil society organizations working in this space. I think the first thing is that we need to follow the money. We need to make sure that the commitments made are actually followed through and that the US Congress actually releases the funding in order to support these initiatives. So we need to see the money put to these commitments. Secondly, we need to actually monitor and lobby for the full, full, fulfillment of these commitments and make sure that the programs are actually implemented. Thirdly, we need to advocate for inclusive investments. So when you read the, the list of 33 um, investments non, that go beyond trade, actually, they also support infrastructure, governance, um, technology, and so on. There are actually only two equating to $2 million that specific, specifically target women, women's um, e e engagement in entrepreneurship and in the energy sector, which is really quite disproportionate, $2 million out of a $55 billion investment. So we also need to start interrogating, are these investments in the right place? Africa has a large youth uh, dividend. You know, how are these investments actually capitalizing on the presence of all these young people? How are we developing programs that will encourage entrepreneurship, for instance, amongst young people? You know, so those are some of the questions that, that still need to, to, to be interrogated and raised at every opportunity that we get um, so, that, so that we can actually um, benefit from, 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 this, from these agreements. Fourth, we need to see increased participation, I think, um, by civil society actors in governance and political processes. Um, and this really also means that civil society organizations themselves have to build credibility. We are the ones who are working on the ground. We are the ones who are working with um, communities. Um, so we know, we, we understand the local context and we have direct contact with populations. You know, we need to document that and utilize that evidence, you know, so that when policies are being developed and they're being thought through, they're informed by the actual lived realities on the ground. And that way they are more responsive and they're more likely to be successful. And finally, um, I think summits such as, you know, the US Africa Leaders Summit should be used to amplify African voices. So you'll find, you'll read some critique that um, on the third day of the summit, the US presented a strategy on how to engage with, Afri with Africa and the African Union. And Ambassador <laughs> Salah Hamad is here. Um, he can respond to that in more detail. But there was also concern that Africa itself did not have, it was, it was disjointed in its response. You know, we did not have a very common, strong position. We did not have an African voice on the key issues. So really going forward, what we would like to see is a strengthened African contingency. We know that we are 55 countries. We're all very different with different interests, but we should be able to have a common voice on key issues that will actually direct how we engage uh, multilaterally in the, in the global space. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, thank you, excellent. And uh, I think uh, we'll have some questions for that uh, as, as well. So I look forward to that discussion. Uh, we're very grateful and uh, sorry, uh, Ambassador Hamad, that you were not on the, uh, on the panelist side. Um, we'll turn to you next. Am Ambassador Salah Hamad is head of the African Governance, Peace and Security Architecture uh, AGA APSA uh, Secretariat and the senior human rights expert within the Department of Political Affairs, the Peace and Security uh, African Union Commission. Um, uh, Ambassador Ahmad, we're delighted to have you here. 
Um, I hope you might respond to um, some of Nikiwe's uh, last remarks, but uh, uh, we'll open up and then turn for questions and comments. Um, so welcome. If you're able to turn your video on, that would be um, excellent, but you may have connection issues. Uh, my video is on. And oh, I can it's see on. I'm video. sorry. <laughs> I was looking at the wrong. Okay. Yes, I got it. Right, Welcome. Good to see uh, you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. And I wish to uh, begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Uh, the link, I think, or the connection was not very clear at some point. So I was not really able to follow all the interventions that were made. But at least I, I heard the intervention made by uh, Madame Kaunda, and I wish to um, thank her for the, uh, for the clear uh, comments that she made on this partnership uh, between Africa and the US. Uh, let me begin also by reemphasizing a few issues that we all know. One, uh, what brings Africa and the US historically is very deep, deeply rooted. Uh, not only in the area of democracy, governance, human rights, but also in many other areas, including uh, economic uh, policies, as well as uh, business environment, business investment, and other areas or sectors uh, that, uh, that we could also highlight today. Uh, but one of the facts that I must begin with, um, that really the partnership or the relationship between Africa uh, and, and, and the US, although it is deeply rooted, but it, it is it's still to be in, in a strategic format, I would say, or framework. Uh, the, the partnership with, with, between Africa and the EU, for example, has been, uh, has been uh, built uh, on a foundation of, of, of a framework that brings Africa and Europe together, which results on regular meetings, regular consultations, and an action plan that is reviewed every uh, every three years. But the partnership with the with the US is is a relationship that is yet to become a partnership within a, a legal framework that could be called a partnership between uh, Africa and the US. And probably that is why uh, we meet uh, uh, not a regular basis. I think uh, Kaunda mentioned that this meeting happened after eight years from the initial meeting that took place uh, before this one. So that is why I think the time has come for uh, Africa and the US to formalize this, this relationship in a partnership with a clear action plan that will address democracy, governance, human rights, but also address, as I mentioned earlier, uh, economic policies as well as uh, business um, uh, opportunities. And I'm saying this because, as you all know, the recent summit that took place, the AU summit, uh, declared 2023 as the year to uh, accelerate the implementation of the CFTA. So the African people are quite hopeful that the acceleration of the implementation of the CFTA will lift the borders between African countries and allow a free movement of goods as well as free movement of persons. So then the African citizens can move around the continent and seek the right to residence and establishment and begin a new life. As we implement and accelerate the implementation of CFTA, there's great opportunities that brings Africa and the US together in the area of investment, as well as economic growth and economic policies. And as much as Af uh, the US is very concerned on promoting democracy, good governance, and rule of law, which, is, which are also priorities for the African Union, and they are part of the Constitutive Act of the African Union, they are in fact enshrined in all the African Union shared values, but we still need to feed our people. Preaching democracy, rule of law in an empty stomach might not be well received. That is why we need to really look into the right to development as a human right and try to begin supporting Africa to build itself, to build agenda, to implement agenda 2063. So then we can build the Africa we want, the Africa that is better for our African people. If we look today at uh, our African youth, 
sadly, just yesterday, probably you have seen on the news about a hundred lives perished while trying to reach Italy. This is just yesterday. And many of them are still missing in the Mediterranean Sea. How many times this should happen for Africa to wake up and say enough is enough, that we need to have better opportunities for our African youth. So then our African youth will not die drowning in the Mediterranean or in the Sahara. And to do so, we have to really strengthen the partnership with the US as much as we can. So we can try to benefit from the development, from the opportunities that this partnership can provide to the African people, particularly the African youth. Indeed, we should not also exclude the civil society. We should not also exclude the private sector. All of this, uh, all of these sectors and the stakeholders should be part of the partnership uh, framework that, that needs to be uh, jointly developed with a clear action plan that will also take into consideration the mutual interests of both the US and Africa. So now, just questions that could be raised. What does a partnership between Africa and the US look, looks like? In practice, I mean. Is it a partnership of multinational companies or international companies that will come after the natural resources uh, in Africa and try to you know, ignore the, uh, the African shared values that we are trying to advocate for or the uh, human rights and business that recently been adopted by, by the policy organs to promote human rights within uh, uh, business, the business sector in Africa. So we really need to, and I'm glad to see as part of the uh, panelist, Professor Kajigala, uh, who is one of my mentors, and, and I hope he will address this particular issue of the nature of this partnership within a legal framework uh, between Africa and the US. Then Kaunda, and I'm sure others will also uh, focus or to some extent address the issue of unconstitutional changes of governments in Africa, the issue of democratic deficit and governance deficits that we are facing. Africans are trying to promote African solutions to African problems, but that certainly will not exclude the partner, the strategic partnerships that we have, and it will not also exclude the, the friends of Africa that have, we have been able to, uh, to promote their friendship for, for the longest. But then how can the US intervention be when it comes to addressing issues of uh, uh, governance deficits as well as uh, democratic government, uh, the democratic deficits? I'm raising this issue because I don't want the US also to be seen as, as, as an external entity that is intervening in the sovereignty of our member states. So this is an issue that also needs to be, uh, to be addressed. If we look at the issue of trade, business growth and, and business policies in general, the CFT, uh, I, I would say, provide a, a, an excellent framework uh, as, 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 as a continental secretariat that is speaking on behalf of Africa when it comes to these issues of, of trade and economic growth uh, within the partnership or the proposed partnership with the US. So now the US, instead of sitting with 55 member states, they can sit only with the secretariat based in Accra to try to formalize ways and means to promote uh, the, 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 the business policy that would be part of the, the, the partnership that would be developed. What is the, what is the long-term outlook of this partnership? Is the focus going to be trade and business only? Is it going to be democratic governance and human rights only? Is it going to be a partnership that will focus on the involvement and engagement of civil society only? Or is it a partnership that will focus on uh, religious interaction and other and, and, and other issues. I will suggest that we need to uh, think of uh, a partnership that is inclusive, a partnership that is that will advance so many issues at the same time. Uh, simply because Africa today, with the implementation of Agenda 2063, and also guided by the implementation of many African shared values, is quite ready and open to learn from other experiences to promote uh, its democratic uh, uh, processes and to try to bridge the gaps when it comes to the uh, to governance and democracy deficit on, uh, uh, at the national level. So this is an opportunity uh, to have a mutual partnership 
that will uh, respect will be based on respect will also be based on, uh, on on mutual benefits as well last but not least I, I really uh, I really value the outcomes of the recent summit that took place in Washington, uh, but I wish to also uh, agree with uh, with Madame Kaunda that uh, the, the 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 recent summit really uh, focused more on, uh, on 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 economic partnerships. Uh, I don't want to say this is a reaction, maybe from my own point of view, of the in, of the Chinese presence in Africa. I don't want to really see it as, a, as also a reaction to, to, to the recent Russian uh, you know, expansion in many African countries, but I really want to see it as a genuine uh, you know, interest in, in assisting Africa to build itself and to build uh, its infrastructure, uh, its economic uh, status and, and its economic situation. So then the African people at the end will benefit from all of this and and then the African welfare, the African well-being will be secure. We have noticed and, and, and recently witnessed the drought that is hitting the eastern part of Africa. And to what extent millions of, of, of citizens of, West, uh, of Eastern Africa in East Ethiopia, Djibouti, Somalia, and, and, and Kenya have been affected. The response is usually aid. But this is not the first time for this crisis to happen in this region. So is the answer is only aid, or the answer is something else? From my point of view, I think these people have been aided throughout the last 80 years, because this crisis has been repeatedly happening every year almost because of climate change. But now what we really need to, to focus on is development. We need to find a way for this, for, for this area to be developed, for these people to benefit from the, you know, the, 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 the water resources that they don't have the possibility of reaching out to at this at this point because of lack of development so then we will ensure that there is sustainability uh, uh, and there is also a development that will ensure that the livelihood and the, the, the well-being of these people is secure nutrition food security in africa is is a crisis and this is a shame it's a crisis in a in a continent that has almost millions of millions of hectares of fertile land that are, need, are yet to be utilized and, and water that is yet to be uh, to be utilized and used. Africa, has, we have been told since I was in primary school that Africa could be the, the food basket, the bread basket of the world when this dream can come true. I really think through partnership with the US and maybe others, but let's uh, keep it with the US since this is the, sub the, the subject of this conversation. We can benefit from the technology and the know-how of farming in the U.S. and make Africa in reality the breadbasket for the for, for the world, especially now with the uh, the conflict that is happening between Russia and Ukraine, which in fact exposed our food system and and, and how weak the food system, the nutrition system, is. In fact, it exposed Africa to the extent that our food security is almost does not exist. And this is really a shame for us as Africans, simply because oh, we have all the land and water that can make Africa the breadbasket of the world. I submit, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that excellent um, presentation and um, your point about that striking the balance between the US um, supporting uh, democracy, calling out say authoritarian regimes but not being seen as an external interloper. And frankly, we've taken a hit on our democracy in, in recent years. And, um, you know, I think, how, how do you, how, how might the U.S. approach that uh, in a way um, that's constructive? Also, just, uh, I, I'm not sure that there's entirely a consensus in Africa on the need for, at least among leaders, among the need for democracy and governance. So, um, you know, the, the CFTA model may not work in that regard. Um, but let, let's turn to uh, Gilbert Kariagala or uh, Bob um, for comments, since you mentioned um, Dr. Kariagala, who was also a bit of a mentor of mine as well. Uh, Gilbert, would you like to say a few words? Uh, Jennifer, thank you very much. Um, 
I do appreciate the panels and uh, they have really raised interesting issues uh, that I just briefly want to touch on a few. And the first one I think is a point that is raised by uh, my good friend, Ambassador uh, Salah, which is um, to what extent can this relationship be formalized uh, along the, the EU, EU Africa lines? Uh, and I think it's an intriguing issue because uh, uh, there has been a lot of reluctance in Africa, or uh, at least within some parts of Africa, to engage with the US formally. Uh, and so if it is a proposal, in fact, that the AU can bring forward, uh, then I think it will be quite an interesting uh, point for discussion uh, with the US now that the US has a, a strategy for Africa. Uh, but I have never really thought about uh, uh, really what the trajectories of that kind of uh, uh, quasi-permanent partnership would mean. Uh, but I just think it's an important point to raise, I think, as we, we keep uh, uh, pondering the future of US-Africa relations. Uh, the second issue that I want to raise is uh, and I think Nikua raised it also, the modesty of the, democ the democratic uh, uh, gains from this conference, the summit, sorry. Uh, the, the countries that were clearly anti-democratic were excluded from the, from the summit, uh, very understandably. Uh, but then uh, the issue is whether in fact the summit was the right forum to be discussing democracy and governance issues. Because a lot of the people who are at the table are actually not democratic regimes. Uh, these are not regimes that are actually govern their people well. And therefore, I can understand why it was impossible to, to raise very high voices <laughs> on democracy and governance at this summit, uh, because you had all kinds of characters uh, congregating in Washington. And so it is a, it's very clear that uh, it was a, a summit that could not come out very visibly on the issues of uh, democratic governance, particularly issues that uh, Ambassador Salah is talking about, the issues around democratic deficit in Africa. So the suggestion here, and uh, I think it was raised in uh, Nikiwe's presentation, probably another forum such as the democracy forum that is anticipated this year in, in, in Zambia uh, would be a better forum to have a, a, a discussion around uh, what does democracy mean and how does the US engage with the democracy or democratic governance issues in Africa. Having said that, I think we have uh, quite a number of things to work around with. I think the pledges that were made on the democracy front are, I think, equally significant, uh, particularly on highlighting the role of civil society uh, in, the, in the whole dynamic of US-Africa relations. Uh, and I just want to paraphrase here that, in fact, Democracy promotion globally now is actually in trouble. Uh, there are very few countries out there willing to stand up uh, very confidently to talk about democracy and governance uh, globally. So this summit really did what I think was enough in, uh, in putting across a few uh, pledges that uh, Africa can work, uh, can work with. It's not like the I think the economic or trade issues that came out of the summit. So that's, uh, I think we should say, we should acknowledge the modesty of this, these gains, but we should also say there will be other forums, there are other better forums that uh, we can address uh, more honestly the, the problems of the democratic deficit in Africa. Uh, and I think the democracy summit probably if the AU is invited as an actor, it will be, it will be an important contribution so that AU can in fact uh, bring to the table some of the initiatives around democracy and governance uh, in Africa. 
Finally, the, the issue that has been raised, which I think is important, is a question that we've been struggling with, which is about the African voice on the US, uh, let alone democracy. Uh, and I think the last meeting that we had uh, in January, I had mentioned that my expectation was the AU summit in Addis Ababa would come up with a policy document to respond to some of the big questions from the Africa US summit. Uh, but I also mentioned at that meeting uh, that I wasn't really too confident that we'll get that reaction or we'll get that African voice. Uh, so I'm still, I'm still appealing uh, now that Ambassador Sala is here uh, and Honorable Topsy Sono is here, uh, we, at least within Africa, uh, within big African institutions, we still need to have the articulation of an African voice on the United States. And I think it will be very helpful because it will answer some of these issues that we uh, we are always repeating ourselves when we say, you know, what should, what does Africa want out of the U.S.? Uh, so you had an, a good summit in December, uh, but we are complaining today that we don't know what the African voices are. <laughs> so at this point, it's late to have an African voice, but I'm saying that we should work at uh, galvanizing an African position in whatever form it comes on the United States, whether it's on democracy or security and, and all these big issues. In fact, that will contribute to what Ambassador Sala is talking about in uh, how you actually shape that partnership in the long run. And thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, good to see you and, uh, and all the participants. And uh, I, um, I should stop here for now. Um. Excellent. Thank you, Gilbert. Uh, great points, as always. Uh, I don't know if Bob wanted to say a few words, or should we go to some questions for the panelists? No, I think uh, uh, it will be better. Thanks, thanks very, very much, first, for the invitation for uh, the moment. Maybe I'll make it a very, very short intervention so that we can allow time for engagement uh, rather than uh, many panel uh, presentations. And I think- and I uh, say Bob played a key role in organizing this. So thank you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. So I, I think uh, in a summarized way, uh, what I see as the democracy, human rights and governance issues arising out of the US Africa Leader Summit is the fact that focus was uh, on democratic transitions more than other democracy and human rights, civil society issues. Uh, in the final action plan, there's an allocation of 75 million US dollars to elections essentially. Uh, and as Nikiwe was saying earlier, and as uh, Prof Kajagala has uh, uh, re-emphasized, you don't see much of discussions on uh, civil society uh, participation on issues of inclusivity, issues of uh, LGBTQ rights. They made, the Africans might say they're not very important, um, but, but uh, it looks like democracy was seen here from an elections perspective alone with a tangible action plan. Uh, and I think I invite you to look at the action document. You will see that indeed there wasn't much of uh, very clear roadmaps on other issues, particularly civil society participation. And as Nikiwe was saying earlier, uh, in fact, during, uh, I think the second, the first day or second day, there was a press conference and uh, journalists were actually up in arms saying, hey, why are we not being invited into some of the sessions? Uh, same to a, a big number of civil society organizations that had hoped to be at the table for discussion, but essentially were excluded. So I think that just goes to emphasize the fact that as a large summit, uh, it touched on many things and didn't want to go deep in, into any particular issue, but clearly the trade investments um, and economic um, uh, dimension of things uh, has a very big upper hand. So I think going forward, obviously colleagues have mentioned that uh, the summit for democracy in Lusaka, Zambia on 29th to 30th, perhaps provides a better opportunity to dig deeper into uh, democracy, human rights, and governance issues. 
And I think as everybody has emphasized here, uh, the African Union has no shortage of positions on matters human rights and democracy. And I think we are very well represented here by Ambassador uh, Hamad and uh, uh, Honorable Topsi Sono who work on these issues and know all these issues. So the point is then, how do we make that connection? Uh, I think the second uh, the point that I will make uh, is that um, uh, in terms of uh, focus on um, issues to do with uh, Africa's participation, Today in this session, we've discussed an Africa's voice, uh, which in some respects can be seen as Africa's public diplomacy, Africa's soft power towards the US. How does Africa respond? Uh, I just wanted to point out that this has actually fe featured and figured quite prominently in other multilateral and bilateral relations that Africa has with other regions. This is a discussion that has been on board uh, with regards to FOCAC, the for Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, since its est establishment in 2000. Same discussion um, with regards to EU-Africa Summit, which, as you notice, was changed recently to AU-EU Summit uh, in some kind of symbolic <laughs> way. Uh, it, it's been the same thing. Um, uh, and with TICAD, the same. But I suppose for the U.S., it uh, is beginning from a lobbyist because of the eight-year hiatus. Uh, it has not uh, been engaging on the continent for eight years. If you look at other relations, TCAT is in its eighth uh, you know, iteration since 1993. FOCAC is also in its eighth iteration after every three years since 2000. EU Africa, AU, EU, now as it's called, uh, has only a gap in uh, between 2000 and 2014, but also has been very regular. So I think the, the U.S. and African leaders have to be intentional to set a periodic um, roadmap. We shouldn't be asking when is the next one. Uh, at the conclusion of uh, the summit in December, we, we didn't have a clear roadmap on when the next one is going to be. We don't have structures the way the Chinese and the Europeans have with Africa, where you have ministerial committees. Where you, I, I think that speaks essentially to what Ambassador Hamad was saying. It's not institutionalized. So it's a one-off. Um, and, and I think that institutionalization will be a great point to, to take on board. I think my uh, final point will be that um, even when we think of Africa, and as Nikiwe said, actually, uh, Africa is 55 countries, but I think that shouldn't worry us too much. I've had that argument also quite a bit over the past. Uh, we can always approach the U.S. at the AU level, the supranational level, or the you know, macro level. We can approach the U.S. from regional economic communities, and that does not preclude individual countries also pursuing their own interests. I, I think that uh, sometimes confuses us as, as Africans because we keep asking, should we approach the U.S. As, at the AU level only or at the SADC uh, level or, or, or to say big states like South Africa or Nigeria engaging with the U.S.? I think all three levels should work. And my final point, I think as, as um, uh, institutions you know, of higher education, uh, universities, civil society, and even uh, colleagues from the AU and so forth, I think the onus is on us to, to offer a structure, to offer a template that can form the basis uh, for the partners to discuss. And thank you very much. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Bob, and, and to all of you. Um, uh, great, uh, great points from all. Um, uh, uh, Honorable Topsy kind of focusing on the need for strengthening institutions and kind of technical capacity building for good governance, um, really important. Um, uh, Nikiwe talking about, uh, you know, how do we have the balance of trade and investment and democracy right, or is, is democracy kind of waning as we focus more and more on, on, on trade and investment? Um, and Dr. Hamad about how, uh, Dr. Uh, Ambassador Hamad on, on how do you really deepen this engagement in a formalized way? Um, so why don't we uh, turn to our audience uh, for questions and comments. Um, please introduce yourself and wait for the mic. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Bishop Joseph Tolton. I'm the president of 
Interconnected Justice. We are a uh, transnational alliance connecting people of African descent on the continent with those of us in the diaspora. My, my questions are for Dr. Kaunda and Ambassador um, Ahmad. Uh, and, and thank you all uh, for your incredible comments. It was really quite riveting. Uh, Dr. Kaunda, you talked about the Diaspora Commission that is being formed by President Biden, uh, to, led by Ambassador Carson. And just a couple of questions for you. What are your thoughts about the definition of the diaspora? And will it be a full definition of both African Americans as well as African immigrants? And, and, and will there be kind of an equal outreach to each of those communities as an integrated uh, community? You also talked about the fact that there's a need to advocate for the US uh, Congress to fulfill the appropriations for supporting President Biden's Africa pivot. My, my contention is that there's a grassroots gap and a funding gap. The natural constituency base to advocate for Africa are African Americans. However, we don't have a trans-Africa anymore. We don't have strong civil society participating in the international space as African Americans. And, and what is your thought um, on that? And if I could just slip in uh, another question, particularly to Ambassador Hamad uh, as well, yeah, you've talked about the need to institutionalize our relationship and the LGBTI issue has come up. I'm wondering if the Africa Union would support both a call for more African-American civil society involvement and also will the Africa Union decry essentially the genocide that is being unleashed by President Museveni uh, on queer Ugandans um, in Africa? Thank you so kindly. Uh, great questions. We'll we'll take a few if the panel doesn't mind and um, come back round. Um, yeah, it, sir, here and then okay, we'll go here and then. Thank you. Um, I'm Linda Silimondene. I'm a PhD student at Howard University in the African Studies Department. Um, I have two questions. One for Dr. Kanda or Kaunda. Um, if I get you well. You said that the relationship between the US and Africa is imbalanced. And you said at some point that Africa has nothing to offer, like in politics, to the US. So my question about that, if I get you well, is that it's not, is it not better for African countries and to think about first like a common strategy before getting into another summit because we have like so many summit on the continent and sometimes i feel like from one summit to the another it's still the same demand and the same question that are raising so the second question that i have is like for everybody and including i think the guy from the african for the study of the united states when he said that yes that africa we need to offer also things and I believe in that because um, from the generation of under 40 of the continent, and I feel like all my life I've been hearing about democracy and people coming with solution for new democracy thing on the continent. And when we look at all the world, and especially I was in France in December, and we see how democracy is in crisis all over the world. And I'm sometimes wondering how can, African offer or what African solution do we have for democracy and how we can use our own indigenous knowledge to create or to, more, to have a model that we can propose to the world for democracy. Because for me, if we are just copying from one continent to another continent, we are going to face the same consequences that those continents are facing today in 20 years. So my question is, do we, can we create or can we think of a model of democracy that Africa can offer to the world? Thank you. Thank you. And then the gentleman here, and then we'll come here. This, this gentleman here. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Then we'll come back for another round. Yeah, I guess this brings up, I'm not sure, um, you're talking, um, this brings up the uh, issue that the, uh, Previous uh, gentleman on my on my left was talking about. I know that uh, I read that 
Africa is one of the greatest um, uh, population increases of any continent on the uh, world. And uh, there's, I know, issues that they can't accommodate all the people that uh, are being created because of the, uh, due to the migrations to prosperous countries. So I'm trying to figure out what are the event, I, and I know there's conservative religion in a lot of these countries with, uh, uh, um, with the, uh, uh, according, uh, you know, persecution of the LGBTQ and, uh, and, and the, the women and the feminism and, and abortion and birth control. So I'm trying to figure out with, that, with these issues of population increase, and uh, and the poverty and, and and the migrations. What are the advantages to punishing people whose lifestyles are not oriented towards uh, procreation, such as LGBTQ and uh, and, uh, and and the abortion and birth control? What they what are the advantages if you if 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 the countries can't take care of their own persons? What are the advantages to punishing those who uh, are forcing people to create more people and punishing those who okay. are not more? Or, or I'm sorry if I. Yeah, no, we I, we got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Madam Jennifer, may I go first, please? Yes. Yes. Uh, and unfortunately, I will have to <laughs> try to uh, respond before I leave because I have another commitment. Uh, mm -hmm. But let me begin by this issue of diaspora. Our heads of state and government pronounce themselves on this issue of diaspora, that uh, each and every one who is on African uh, descent living abroad is part of this diaspora. We are not really part of the debate between Black American and African American in the US. That is an internal debate totally. But anyone who has an African blood, I would say, can consider himself or herself part of the African diaspora. Our heads of state and government also declared the diaspora as the sixth region. Africa has five regions. The diaspora is the sixth region. And to be honest with you, I personally been working very closely with ECOSOC to promote the presence of our diaspora in our activities and programs. We have a number of organizations that are representing diaspora, but we really hope for a more united diaspora because a more united diaspora will certainly assist Africa better and provide more support, if not financial support, at least you know, ideas and thoughts on how Africa can, Africa can, be, can be built uh, 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 in, a, in, in a better way. So, for us, diaspora is that way. You could be of a white skin, born in Africa, but migrated to another country, you're still an African. Africa is a rainbow color. We have so many uh, you know, diversity of uh, different colors, different languages, different religions. And we're very proud of this diversity because that is exactly where is our unity is coming from, from that diversity that we have on the continent. The, the issue of the partnership uh, with, with the US, as I mentioned, is, is yet to be formalized. And probably that is why there are so many gaps currently in implementing joint activities and programs. We don't have an action plan per se that brings Africa and, and the US together, similarly to the one we have with the European Union, for example. And by the way, I'm the focal person for the partnership with the, between Africa and the EU uh, on, on democratic governance and human rights. We don't have that. We meet on a regular basis. We meet every year on human rights. We have a human rights dialogue with Europe every year. We have a, a dialogue on democracy and governance almost every year. Before and every summit, there is a civil society engagement or civil society consultation. That is a must. And we have so many consultations that take place in, uh, in between, between summits and between uh, uh, consultations. We don't have a similar action plan or a similar work plan with, for, for the relationship with the US. And probably that is what we really need to, to think of. Africa never said uh, that, never pronounced itself against LGBTI, never. There are some African countries that have internal um, uh, laws and rules against this and that. But for us as Africans, we are guided by the African Charter on, Demo on, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights which is a charter that is preserved in the lives of all Africans, whether you are gay, lesbian, or, or, or not. What we really need to, to do now is to see how the, the internal process of implementation could be strengthened and enhanced. And that is why we come to the issue of capacity, of uh, the lack of capacity within member states. 
some of our member states they don't even understand the, the, the provision of our charters. And that is why within the ACA APSA Secretariat, we are leading a campaign to ensure citizen engagement in the African Union affairs. Because with the engagement of citizens in our affairs as African Union, we will ensure that the African Union is a, is a citizen or is, it's an African uh, citizen reorganization that is not only a club of member states. And, and by the way, we have a wide of programs and activities that could be also supported. We have, we have partnership with, with many European partners and stakeholders to promote this citizen engagement process at the national level. We have, we have the YES, the youth engagement process, uh, I mean strategy. We have the West, the women empowerment strategy. We have so many other programs and activities, but unfortunately the time would not allow me to speak about all of them. What, I've, what I'm trying to say is there are so many opportunities for you as Africans and for those who are friends of Africa to, 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 to try to strengthen and enhance the national capacity to make sure the African shared values are implemented, domesticated, and promote it at the national level. There is no impunity. Certainly, no one is above the law. And, and, and Africa has proved itself in that regard. We have head, former heads of the state and government being tried. The former heads of the state and uh, the former head of, uh, of state, uh, the former president of Chad was tried in an African uh, court, was jailed in an African prison until he died. And, and, and there's no exception. Absolutely. But what we really need to do is to focus on partnerships that will assist the continent, particularly the African Union and its member states to enhance the capacity at the national level for better implementation, domestication uh, of African shared values and instruments. Uh, our uh, dear sister Rita, who is below the age of 40, I want to tell you that Africa, the Africa we are talking about today, although Africa is the the, the, the birthplace of mankind, the birthplace of civilization. But the Africa we are talking about today is only 60 years old after independence, only 60 years old. That means what we really need to do is to keep evaluating the process of promoting democracy and good governance. Yes, Africa has its own share, has its own jurisprudence, and that is why we are trying to promote the African shared values as a concept. As, a, as jurisprudence to support the international and global jurisprudence. Yes, democracy governance has international standards, but we feel as Africans that we can contribute by promoting our own African shared values to support the global jurisprudence, the global standards that currently in existence. And the only way for that to, for that, for that to happen, it's for us, for us as Africans to believe in what we inherited, what we have, and to make sure that what we have is really in line with the international standards and with the priorities of the African Union Constitutive Act and the African Union Shared Values Instruments. That way, we, we, we will make sure that we are on the right track to make Africa a better place for all of us to live. I thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Salah. And uh, uh, will you be needing to go now, shall we say, or? Uh, unfortunately, Jennifer, I, I thought we will start on time. I'm not blaming you, of course, for the delay. Technology can sometimes, you know, drive us crazy. But unfortunately, I have another commitment that I need okay. to attend to. It is not as important as this one, but unfortunately, it's, it's a commitment. <laughs> Listen, we are delighted you were able to join us. And uh, thank you for uh, great answers and, and for your presentation. Um, uh, lo looking forward to maybe being part of the conversation in Zambia and with God grace in the future, in the near future. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you. And I will uh, turn back to our audience for uh, questions. Good. Uh, gentleman here. Sorry to point, but. Uh... No problem. Um, Rodney Smith, I'm a, a PhD student at Howard in the uh, Department of African Studies. Uh, my question is for the commissioner. Um, I want to mispronounce the last name. Uh, commissioner Tashi Um What efforts are being made by the African Commission to um, promote or to research, log, and then uh, escalate or bring to the world uh, traditional or African 
legal mechanisms that can be used in supplement to international law or international standards in, in terms of dealing with uh, uh, international criminal law. Yes, yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Abdel Munsharu. I'm also a, a PhD student at Howard University, Department of African Studies. I'm originally from Cameroon, and uh, I was laughing because my uh, fellow uh, <laughs> classmates, they kind of asked what I was about to ask, but you know, I'm going to ask it also so that uh, at least we're going to have an answer that is close to whatever they wanted to know. So uh, I'm pretty much uh, I would like to thank the audience first, the, the, the speakers first, and uh, I, what I want to say is about uh, my love for cultural aspect of democracy and governance and uh, human rights. So going back to what my uh, classmate Linda and uh, the gentleman also asked, I do believe that Africa has a lot to bring to the rest of the world, like to teach the rest of the world, including the United States. And uh, given the fact that Africa is very diverse. I do believe that sometimes, you know, whatever is going on in the AU, it's uh, kind of uh, difficult to implement because of that diversity. So my question now is about, uh, to, to anyone who wants to answer it, what do you think about the combination of traditional regional uh, political institutions, as well as like regional, uh, as well as political like modern or contemporary political institutions as an alternative to increase uh, the participation of local population, civil societies in the political process of African countries. And uh, I do believe that uh, there is something to get from uh, those, uh, the, from that con combination as far as like identifying the real needs of local population, because most of the time they are not. Uh, uh, they are excluded from the policy recommendations that are happening in their countries. And uh, I also believe that with the current political process, most of the time, the people that are involved are just what is so-called like elite that are mainly formed in Western uh, you know, universities or maybe Western system of thinking. And, uh, you know, the system is restricted to those people and the people that are in rural areas or that, are, that have some sort of power, they are usually used as, um, I know the name in French, when they call like the bétail de campagne, like when they have like elections, they go there and they just get a like, vote without actually looking into what they need. So that was just my question. I don't know if uh, I made, that made sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's let's start with uh, Honorable Topsy, and then we'll go to Nikiwa and 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 Bob and Gilbert if you have responses. Hi, uh, thank you for the gentleman who asked the question about uh, the African way of dealing with conflicts. Uh, it is a unique way that some African states have uh, in dealing with conflicts, going to elders and having a, a settlement procedure. Unfortunately, uh, we have not, in Africa, we have not exported that idea, but it's a good thing that we might consider in the future. But I think as well, uh, we would not want to uh, force this upon other countries. If they think that it is working, it is for these other countries to adopt the system. And but it's a good idea that we might promote this, and uh, in a lot of areas, uh, it is promoted and it is uh, widely spread in most of the African villages. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nikki Wei. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Jen. Um, so Rodney, Abdel, and Linda all refer to you know. Um, how we can capitalize on African experiences, African traditions, and really incorporate them in, in, in what we do. And you know what, this is the reason why we have, we have scholars like yourselves and practitioners like some of us around the room, 
um, it's to really go out there and to be ambassadors and not just speaking about it, but also doing it, you know? Um, so we're really hoping that you, you could be the ones to bear that torch. And when you go out into practice, you know, you're able to implement um, what you're referring to. But when you really talk about um, the legal system, you will find that a lot of transitional justice practices in the region, when you go to areas of conflict, whether it's, it's or where there's been instability. I know the examples from Malawi, from Mozambique, um, where you know African tra transitional justice principles and methods have been incorporated. You know, so it's not like we don't have the experience. We do. It's really about again amplifying African voices and 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 ways of doing things. Um, another another example really is countries like like Botswana, which has a dual common law and customary law system that runs parallel, you know? Um, so it, it, it really is about amplifying, sharing these practices and seeing whether, whether they can be absorbed, you know, um, in, in different localities. Um, thank you for your questions, very thought provoking. Go oh, Howard. <laughs> um, Bob or, or uh, Gilbert, or should we go to the next round? Okay, no, I think I can, uh, oh, give, Prof, you can go first. No, I just wanted to address the question of uh, uh, democracy, African democracy. And I think my short answer there is, uh, I think African democracy has to borrow from uh, universal values around participation, accountability, responsiveness, rotation of power, all these good things that we associate with democracy. But I think the lady who asked that question was talking about, I mean, uh, how, how can Africa contribute therefore uh, to these values? Uh, I think I do appreciate that uh, democracies are reflected in very different cultural contexts. And that is a universal problem too. I mean, that there is no uh, one size fit all. So the question is how we therefore work towards achieving these values in Africa and how Africa then can bring out its distinctiveness uh, from the very fact that we are also doing things that are very universal but are reflected in our own context. So the issue of local content is important. Uh, but as soon as, I mean, as long as we do appreciate that there are certain universals that we should hold constant uh, and that African countries are living up to those expectations, uh, and then we are really off to a good, uh, a good uh, uh, grounding on what democracy is all about and how Africa can contribute to global norms around democracy. Huh? Well, well, I'm um, done. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, so my contribution will be very quick, uh, which is, uh, I think, to just uh, take off or, you know, uh, move on from where Nikiwe and uh, Gilbert have left, which is to say sometimes when we talk of African democracy, it, it, it becomes an excuse in some respects, not all. It becomes an excuse for committing atrocities, and hiding behind African democracy to do some terrible things. And I think this is what we have seen in places such as Mali, uh, in, in Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Burkina Faso, all these countries now are under military junta or uh, are, are moving towards failed states. I think the spectacular case of Somalia is a case in point where there's been an attempt to um, lead the country via traditional Somali principles that have not quite worked. Uh, and, and so, as my colleagues have said, there are cases where uh, African democracy has worked. It, it still works in some many villages across the continent, but sometimes when it is appropriated by certain leaders who do not have respect for universal values like participation, peace, and so forth, then it's abused. And, that, and that's my contribution there. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you. I'm gonna take another round. I'm gonna go to Mel Foote first. Uh, I, I did want to maybe bring up two points that 
that came to me late. I was I just got back from Nigeria very late, so I'm a slow off the mark. Um, one is on this balance of trade and investment versus democracy. Kind of, are we going too far towards trade and investment without adequate attention to democracy? And I just wonder, we, you know, does it have to be either or? Um, can we not better link the democracy and governance agenda to the trade and investment agenda? Um, that investors are looking for a rule of law. Um, they're looking for transparency. Um, they're, you know, they do not welcome uncertainty, political uncertainty, or political risk, you know, uh, social tension, um, insecurity generally. Um, and there just may be ways to, and 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 a number have uh, uh, shareholders who are keen for kind of good ethical practice. And I just, I wonder if there might be a, a better way to tie those two agendas, because I don't think we we can. U.S. just can't forego the trade and investment, which is kind of where the future is, but um, it might be able to blend the democracy uh, agenda into that better, um, as still as it works with civil society and so forth. And the other, it goes to somewhat of uh, Gilbert's point about, you know, is this the, the whole Africa summit the best place for these discussions? And I've just wondered in this in the past whether there might not be kind of a coalition of the willing, I mean, that that uh, term, uh, you know, has bad associations with the Iraq war, um, but perhaps the coalition of willing democracies who are, are willing to kind of help set a standard um, and bring others on board. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll turn to uh, Mel and then I'll, I'll look for other questions. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Uh, enjoyed the discussion very much. Uh, you know, when it comes to the U.S.-Africa summit, I've always felt the two weaknesses of the summit was the Africans came here individually. Uh, they came on their own airplane. They didn't talk us before coming. Uh, if Africans would have came and said, uh, President Biden, we got four things we want from the United States. We want seven hospitals around the continent, blah, blah, blah. They would have left for two of those. They would get the third one by the end of the year. The other issue was the diaspora, and I think you raised it. Uh, the reality is Africa didn't caucus with the diaspora before the summit. And uh, even now, um, you know, the, the view of the diaspora is uh, standoffish. Uh, there is no uh, push to engage the diaspora. The definition of diaspora, they don't want to really talk about. I want to say something about the, uh, the diaspora uh, committee that the government is setting up. I have had uh, discussion with senior level uh, government people, they talk about 12 people, you know, going to be on this. Uh, it's going to be led by a U.S. Foreign Service officer. So that kind of speaks to uh, the fact that it's going to have a political agenda. And I suspect that uh, uh, people who don't necessarily go along with U.S. government position uh, are not going to be included in, you know, that discussion. So that's something to, to bear hold. But I also think that, um, uh, you know, in order for us to to really make this thing work. Uh, you know, Africans are gonna have to stand up and, and, and define themselves. There, there need to be a, really a push around Africa to make everybody agree on something. Um, but having everybody with their own viewpoint, uh, we're not gonna get to the goal line. And I think that uh, right now Africa is being, you know, the competition for Africa is full fledged right now. China is coming full fledged, Russia is coming full, the US is coming full fledged. And we're not coming there to help Africa. We're coming for your resources. And, you know, I think that that has been, you know, kind of pushed to the side, but this is all about oil, gas, cotan, uh, et cetera. And so um, I just, uh, I mean, the, the struggle continues. Uh, we have to, the biggest problem with America uh, is, and I've told the administration, uh, Americans are uneducated, undereducated, and miseducated about Africa. And there are no resources to change that paradigm. Uh, you know, we're the most underfunded organization uh, in Washington, you know, so we have to constantly pull rabbits out of our hat, as opposed to uh, having resources to do town hall meetings around the country, get the African Diplomatic uh, Corps deployed, getting people in Nebraska and, and Iowa and other places to understand uh, what Africa is. If you go out there and say, how many countries in Africa? There's over oh, a thousand, or in one country, you get the most weirdest uh, views. So I just want to throw that out. I enjoyed this conversation. 
this is just one of many conversations that we need to continue to have. This is a perfect vehicle where Africa is ta actually talking to America uh, is, in real time is a good thing. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, gentleman in the back. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I want to uh, start by introducing myself. My name is uh, Paimeshi Ian Yenko. I am uh, an attorney called practice in Cameroon and Nigeria, and I double as executive director of the Settlement House for Dispute Resolution and Reconciliation. This is an institution uh, based in Cameroon where we try to you know, settle cases amicably between continent parties without them resorting to litigation. I want to thank um, the previous speakers and uh, some of the laudable um, you know, remarks they made in respect to democracy and good practices in Africa and the world, of course. But this morning, I would like to talk more about uh, the case of uh, the Southern Cameroons. I don't know if many of you are aware of uh, the Southern Cameroons. The Southern Cameroons, uh, what we call the former British Southern Cameroons, was a uh, first territory handed over by uh, the United Nations at the dawn of the Second World War to Great Britain to uh, administer them towards uh, independence. Regrettably, 60 years later, the Southern Cameroons is at the crossroad. As I speak, more than close to a million people are displaced, more than 500,000 have been killed by the, the, the regime of President Paul B. And as I speak this morning, I mean, I run an orphanage in, in, in Cameroon, and uh, uh, one of the kids was shot in the leg this morning by a security official. What is the African Union doing about this? What is the international community doing about this? In December, I watched Paul B. when he came for a conference here, and how he was lauded. I mean, he, he's, he's in power, well over 40 years in power. What is the United States and, 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 and the Western states, what we call the civilized uh, nations doing, you know, to, to authoritarian regimes like, like Polbia in Africa? What are they doing? Because this, this to us is a mockery on democracy. And I just to add to what uh, one of the speakers said in respect to um, America not focusing, the US not focusing so much on uh, you know, transition to democracy, but actually looking at best practices, human rights practices at the empirical level in Africa. I think that's important. And I just want to say that uh, if, if the, 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 the speakers can, can, can throw some light, because the media is doing nothing in respect to the plight of the Southern Cameroons, there's nothing we get in the news. All we hear these days is Ukrainian, but I mean, egregious human rights violation has been perpetrated on, on armed civilians on a daily basis in Cameroon. Villages are raised to the ground every day. It's acute. Kids can go to school because of this crisis. Thank you. I think we should pay more attention to this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Additional questions. Uh, I'll, I'll turn to our speakers. Oh, we do have one more. So hi, my name is Mary Apollo. Good I say? So I'm originally from South Sudan, and we led a group called the Global Emergency Disaster Responder, uh, the group that was funded during the COVID. So in the U.S. African Summit, we have submitted a declaration uh, for the for the White House that are asking news demands and our perspective uh, on the, the policy that we want to see in the, uh, in the regional level and internationally. So I wish that we get more people to solid, the solidarity from different organizations and, and individuals to support our initiative. Uh, so with, but the, my, my point is, Africa has a, a rate of uh, like 75% of the younger people are youth and the people who are in power uh, up uh, within the ages of 65. Uh, so this, there is a, a gap of 30 years different uh, like generation gap 
our, and our generation have their own uh, views, have their own perspective, and they want to be part of decision making. So I just want, yeah, want, want to know the point of view of the speakers when it comes to African uh, youth and their participation or leadership. As a, we have to create like international dialogue between the elder generation and the younger people. So you, we reach to a level where we can agree on certain things uh, to engage young people on that or what we can do further. Uh, this is also a question that I have to raise. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, let's turn back to our speakers. Um, Topsy, would you like to respond? And then Nikki Wei? It's a broad range of questions there. Um, okay, who would like to respond? <laughs> All right, I have a point to make. Oh. Uh, who was that? Tonga, Nikira. Yes, go oh, please. Nikira. Yeah. I'll, I'll go after Prof. Kajahala. He had his hand up. Yeah, thank you, Nikira. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I think I want to start with your question, which was, uh, has the pendulum gone too far between trade and democracy? And I think that's an excellent question. Uh, and you are correct that. Uh, there should be no distinction between trade and democracy. But as I said from the beginning, democracy promotion is in trouble. And we are not in an era where you had conditionalities that were clearly targeted at the promotion of good governance linked to trade agreements. Uh, linked to investment agreements. You remember that era of conditionalities. And a lot of African countries resisted that era because they were simply saying, we don't want the outsiders to be talking to us about democracy. We know what democracy means. Uh, but there was in fact a very steadfast position by a lot of the international players that you cannot trade off democracy uh, or rather trade development from democracy. So I think we've lost that, 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 uh, that era. I think we are no longer in that era. And there are a lot of explanations for that. Some have already been presented here, but I just want to say, I think that's the point we should in fact be focusing on so that we are not losing our eye on the ball, which is actually democracy. Uh, and I've always believed that if you have democracy and good governance, all these things are going to come. In fact, good things go together. <laughs> so democracy should go alongside trade. Uh, and that's why I like the question because uh, there is a worrisome trend uh, that even countries that are democracy promoters like the US are now coming up and saying, no, probably democracy is not as important. And I think this is what we saw in this summit where you have people like Paul Beer given platforms to address the world. And Paul Beer should be at home, not in Washington, DC. So that's the whole dilemma of having forums of this nature to speak more honestly about democracy. And my point is that they can't. They are not positioned to do that. Finally, my old friend Malfoot has raised the issue of why wasn't the diaspora not consulted by Africans? if it is the fifth rank. I wish Ambassador Salah was still here because it's an important question that we've been raising. If the diaspora is important and the African, Af the African countries are coming to Washington, what attempt did they make, in fact, to reach out to the diaspora? Uh, more ideally before the, the, before the summit or even not before the summit, after the summit. So it shows that there is a very wide gap between the declaration on the diaspora and the reality on the ground. So we have to keep pushing that if the diaspora is important, where is it when it comes to African issues? Finally, Mary, very good question on generational change. I think that's a big issue now on the agenda in Africa because of the generational gaps. But I think one of the solutions is to have people like you 
standing up every day and raising the issue about governance and inclusion and representation. And I think it's the time that the youth stood up more firmly on these very, very important issues because generational change is going to come as the elders die off. But we need the youth, in fact, to be ready to stand up and take up those positions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gilbert. Now, Nikki Ray. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to add on to um, what Pe Pesheshi was, was, was referring to about Cameroon, interestingly, the US is, is one of Cameroon's biggest trading partners. I think it's in the top five or top six. So that already, you know, will tell you what the foreign relations policy um, is, is, going to, is going to look like. But um, just, um, I want to touch on what um, Prof Kajakala was talking about. Really, it doesn't have to be a trade-off between trade and governance. And that is why I think this, the, the theme for the upcoming Summit for Democracy in Zambia is so apt. It's, it's really titled Democracy Delivers, that's it. You know, and they're looking at, is it, you know, so they have various panels looking at, does it deliver politically, economically, socially? What does it mean for different interest groups, young people, women, political participation, um, natural resource governance? All those things are covered. And um, I'd be happy to get your, your contacts, Jen, and everybody else who's, who's, who's um, participating in this, because Open Society Foundations is actually working really closely with the government of Zambia. Um, there is a third day of the summit that's being planned, which is the 31st of, of, of March. The two official days are 29th and 30th, but the government has agreed to a third day where we're going to focus on policymakers engaging with civil society actors. And some of those questions that I mentioned earlier around dealing with countries in crisis, dealing with the the question of what does democracy look like? What does it mean in an African context? How do we define it? Um, what is it that we can take out to the world out there? We, we, we want to look at, um, we have a panel focusing on young people and youth. You know, we talk about democracy and governance, but what does it look like to them? You know, um, are there tangible benefits, you know, to this, you know, all these democratic dispensations that we have. So I'd really love to share information because one of the things that we're planning to do is to have online um, dialogues pre and post the summit so that it's not, it's not a once off discussion. And um, I can assure you that the Zambian government is very aware of the responsibility that it carries in terms of not only positioning itself as, as one example of, 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 of good governance, but also of you know, bearing the torch and um, providing a platform for other African countries to share their experiences of, of, of what is working, um, working not only for, for the state politically, but also for, for the people. Um, and then just one thing I, 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 that I'm really taking away is a very, very pertinent question about how we engage with the diaspora. I've made a note of that. I've made a note uh, and the, the proposal as well that we actually need to be engaging with um, American audiences as well, you know, explaining what Africa is, you know, what we have, how we do things. I think that we take it for granted that we're all on the same page and we understand um, uh, the, the, the issues. So that's a very good suggestion that it has to be a reciprocal process um, um, and that we have a lot to learn from each other and that we, sh we should definitely also include um, organizations in the diaspora when we talk about capacity building, awareness, and engagement in policy processes. So um, thank you very much for, for those suggestions. Thank Jennifer. you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I just was hoping to ask a follow-up question to Kaunda, specifically uh, as it relates to engaging the diaspora. You know, Reagan was, and was not uh, pushing back against apartheid. It took Trans-Africa to do so, specifically in terms of mobilizing 
African Americans and African immigrants uh, to be at the table. I think to Melford's point, our organizations are underfunded, transnational coalitions are underfunded. Lastly, the government of Zambia is, uh, does, has not decriminalized LGBT activity. In Southern Africa, half of the countries have, if they are the new beacon of democracy in Africa, on that third day, will OSF push for some content dealing with the LGBT issue? Okay, so I think Jennifer, if I may, I could add a point or two. Okay, and then we'll, yeah. uh, we'll turn to Nikki Wei for response to that response. Yes. Oh, no, okay, Nikki Wei, maybe you can respond first. I think. Uh... Okay, yeah, just, just a quick response. Yes, in terms of that third day discussions, we are partnering with other civil society actors as well. And um, look, we do not shy away from the issue of human rights. Um, and, and, and issues or questions around equity and representation and inclusivity and LGBTQI rights is, is definitely um, on the agenda. We support quite a number of actors in Zambia itself, actually, and the decrim uh, campaign um, we're fully behind. So we, we don't shy away from that at, at all. Um, yeah, point well noted around mobilizing um, African-Americans and transnational coalitions. Uh, I, I take that on board. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Bob. All right. Sure. I, I think mine is uh, is hardly uh, any lengthy intervention at this point. I, I think it's almost as uh, as if um, uh, all the points of discussion, um, be it uh, the comparison between trade and democracy, or, or, or you know diaspora engagement and so forth, all these things seem to suggest that. Uh, we need a solid substantive response and that can only be done by us sitting down and having almost a blow to blow response in terms of creating a framework of engagement across peace and security democracy and human rights um and i think uh, people like uh, mel melfoot uh, who is here from constituency for africa will be key partners in uh, crafting such a response. And I suppose the time is now to actually create that, uh, you know, uh, framework of engagement that is, um, you know, Africa directed towards the US, but also response from the US uh, partners, including uh, civil society, including universities, including GW and University of Southern California and so forth. Uh, so in a nutshell, I thought, uh, even if we went into, I mean, it's good to discuss the nuances and so forth, but ultimately, particularly from the AU perspective, uh, what we have seen is that when the AU comes up with common positions, it will have been um, colleagues from universities or civil society organizations uh, or think tanks for that matter that come up with initial drafts. Otherwise, waiting for ADIS to come up with any solid document that can form the basis for discussion is waiting for CODOT. Uh, so, so I suppose um, uh, in a nutshell, that's perhaps what we can consider. Thank you. I did, I did want to say one thing on Cameroon. Um, I mean, I do think it's shameful or surprising at least that there's not been more kind of proactive effort at uh, conflict resolution in Cameroon. I think part of this is uh, stems from a horribly obsolete tendency on the US government to defer to France when it comes to Franc Francophone uh, African countries in terms of conflict resolution or interventions. Um, also, I mean, you did ask, where is the African Union? And I think in, in cases where US diplomatic intervention has been most effective, and I, I think about Sudan, I think about Cote d'Ivoire, a number of other places, it has come in kind of behind uh, the regional economic body and behind the African Union. And so Cote d'Ivoire had ECOWAS, the African Union, um, the UN Security Council kind of, and the US, um, President Obama made calls to, to backbow it. So it was a, a kind of multi-layered, effort uh, in Zimbabwe, where SADC had not um, uh, really uh, been particularly active on Zimbabwe, or um, the US for all its sanctions and uh, kind of loud rhetoric was not that effective. And the African Union was kind of nowhere on, on uh, Zimbabwe either. And so 
uh, you know, I do think there's a there's fault with the United States on on kind of not focusing on some of the conflicts and issues. Um, but it does need to come in as part of a coalition. I think the African Union has to be uh, pushing it in the first instance. And why they're not engaged on Cameroon, I, I could not tell you. I think we're at the scheduled end of our program. Sure. <laughs> thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you all who've joined us online. Uh, and uh, I see we have more people online than uh, in person this time, but that, that may increase. If you're not on our mailing list, uh, please uh, let me know before you leave or those online. You can email me at acpowell, all one word, at usc.edu. All right, write your email down here. And uh, our next forum is Monday, March 27th on trade and investment.